，那我们就开始吧，还是？怎么没有回应了 ？Sure, yeah, let's start. Okay.、Um, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone.、Uh, thank you so much for your participating on Friday night.、Um, so I just want to make sure can everyone see my screen? Yes, everything is alright. Okay. Good.、Um, so tonight I want to talk about、uh, system design,、uh, more like an introduction for the interview.、Um, so because I'm not a, a senior background、uh, backend developer, so I only have three years of experience.、Uh, maybe like if in the audience anyone have senior、um, developers, if you find anything that you don't agree or something you want to add, please feel free to、uh, interrupt me. And for anyone who have questions, you can either to ask me in the chat. I'll be looking at it all the time, and also you can just interrupt interrupt me di directly.、Uh, so basically,、um, I prepared this、um, uh, this presentation based on a lot of、uh, external informations. Um, the reason why is because、um, system design is a very、uh, open question. Uh, when you when you have an interview, it's not only to、um, to interview、uh, your knowledge, but also、uh, to see how open you are about、uh, doing trade off and to accept、uh, new ideas and、uh, correct your mistakes. Like your interviewer will be evaluate you as a future employee and a future coworker. Like he's also he or she. So also、um, like seeing if you are able to to co、uh, collaborate or not.、Uh, so this all these resources I put here are the resources that will give you a、uh, different views on 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 subject. For example, if we talk about designing、uh, Twitter,、uh, maybe different people have different preferences. It's better that you look at different resources so that you know all the different trade offs. Um, so I separated all these resources into two part. One is for general system in,、uh, system design.、Uh, basically, in this sector, you there are three courses.、Uh, one, two are in Chinese. One is Jiuzhang、uh, system design, and the ACM system design is really good as well. And also the uh, uh, grouping the system design course is is pretty. It covers a、uh, um, A big range, but、uh, it's not detailed enough.、Uh, that you may you might want to look at other informations in order to to be able to answer all the questions that you're going to get in the interview. And this book is really highly recommended.、Um, it's called the Designing Data Intensive Applications.、Um, it's a very good book that you have to to read it like before you go to interviews. Um, also, there's a GitHub repo which is called System Design Primer. It's very good as well,、uh, especially for machine learning system designs. These are required by、um, by people who are interviewing as a machine learning engineer or software engineer in machine learning.、Um, so there's less inform less classes that you can take, but、uh, there's more、uh, technical blogs like uh, uh, Netflix, Uber, and Airbnb. They all have. Um, like written blogs about their infrastructure, which are really interesting, and also there's、um, one GitHub repo called the Machine Learning System Design. The girl from、um, uh, from Nvidia who 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 wrote this, and it's、uh, it's very interesting. Also, there's a very short short blog、uh, person talking about the, his interview,、um, like、uh, feedback. Um, uh, so here's some examples of the question you might、uh, see in the interview. For example,、um, the interviewer will just ask you to design Twitter or design Instagram, and also、uh, it could be a part of、uh, a big system such as just to design the news feed of, feed of Facebook. And in terms of machine learning design, I think most questions are asked about、uh, the recommender system. And there's a, 
also a lot of recommender systems, which are like a restaurant recommendation, which is based on the um, the user's um, personal taste and also the geolocation and also Instagram story or Spotify um, uh, YouTube music recommendation. This way you have to deal with um, the music as your data. So there's a lot of uh, different variations that you might need to consider when you answer these questions. And other topics uh, that I heard from other places are imagine myself, but I don't really know if they were asked. Um, uh, for example, the human in the loop labeling system. Um, basically the system ask, um, so ask you to, to have a people, maybe a human labor to label images. And using this new labels, you will continually retrain the model. And once the model uh, have a better score than the previous version, you may release a new version of model either into a new loop of labeling or release it into the production so that uh, um, the users can use this, the result of this model as well. And also fraud detection um, uh, or maybe house price prediction and the stock price prediction. But these are like, I'm not so sure which company interviewed with these questions. I, I just think this could be very interesting questions to discuss about. Um, so in terms of general uh, system designs, I just uh, caught it what uh, I learned from the Joe Jones class. So they, they basically ask you to answer questions in, in four, they call it four S steps. Uh, first, when you get a question, which you, which is really broad, uh, broad, you you need to ask what are the features are requested for this uh, service, and you have to discuss about uh, the QPS, which are the queries per second, and uh, the daily active user and the monthly active user. All those informations those will help you to to decide the scale, the everything you want to put in your in your in your answers. And then the service, actually you have to split um, the big system you're going to build into different smaller systems, which are kind of isolated um, into providing different type of services, but together they will work as a big system. Um, uh, maybe I'll take an example, for example, for Google map, there, there will have system uh, services such as um, you have the interface for users and you also have maybe a service that's going to uh, to provide the, uh, the data. Maybe one system was just about to to reviewing the, the map information. Like for example, um, there might be human labors to, to, to evaluate all the traffic information to see if the information on Google map are correct or not. And they also take feedback from users. So there's always different types of services. Um, in terms of storage, uh, which is actually the, the, I would say the most important part, you need to decide based on the scale you're working on to, to decide what will be the data schema. Like you, you, you really have to give, um, the schema of each table, your how you want to design each table, and explain them what are the keys you want to put in your in your table. You have to explain this in detail, and also um, whether you're going to choose um, a SQL database or no SQL database, and why you're going to use a file system. Uh, and then the last part will be the scaling, um, considering the system view go bigger and there will be new users coming in every day. And how would you like to optimize your system um, to, to increase uh, the capability of uh, giving like rapid response to users requires, re requirements? So um, other things you also need to consider is the reliability and scalability, Okay, which is actually just the, the last part I said. Uh, but talk about it in more in details. So in terms of reliability, like in an ideal world, you, you don't need to think about this. There will never be um, a disk crash or RAM faulty or, or power down. And um, that's not a problem, but in terms of the real world, you have to take consider all this information so that you 
you, your service won't go down. Um, also, the scalability is uh, um, is also a question to ask the inter interviewer, like if the system is going to, to grow, like which particular way is it going to grow? Maybe it's not like always more users, but it could be more content or, or anything. Um, and you probably want to uh, talk about the performance, like uh, what will be the, the time for each query to, to respond, like what's, what will, will be the, the goal of the performance of the system. Um, and uh, once you finished, like you, you finish designing everything and you, you look back, you just um, go through everything, maybe you can get questions like, uh, um, what is the bottleneck of your design? And uh, what will be the, the trade-off? Like more like in the data level. And the interviewer may ask you, I want to have um, strong con con consistency and also a high availability, is this possible? And you, you, you actually have to know this um, CAP theorem, which is like the consistency of availability and partition tolerance cannot all work together. Only two of them will work, but you have to have the partition tolerance. Um, like you have to have it, so you can only do the trade off between consistency and availability. Um, so basically, this also gives us the, um, the idea of well, are we going to use a SQL uh, database or no SQL database? Mm, so, in general, SQL database gave you. Uh, high consistency, but a lower availability. Like people like uh, um, service like the bank might prefer it so that like you're sending money to another person and you have to make sure that your money was sent and the person received the money that both steps worked. And then we, we change the, the database that we, 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 we cannot really accept at certain moment that this person have this money and you don't have it. Um, well, for analytics, for example, um, I say that uh, the tweets that you put on Twitter, um, you don't need to modify them. I think you, you can't delete it, but it doesn't have to be like deleted from physically from the disk immediately. So, so information like this, or you, you might do uh, for marketing, you might do aggregated data and um, all those information, you don't really need them to have a uh, high consistency. So, so you prefer to have higher availability, which means that whenever the user make a query, it always works. So that's more important. Um, so these are more information I put here. Um, like uh, I also put some link here under the, the this PowerPoint. I have this kind of link in all different pages and you can, I will send you the, uh, the presentation afterwards so that you can read all the informations. Um, okay, so. So here I'll just give you an example. I won't go too deep into it, but it will be a way that we can think about it together. Like if the interviewer asks you, how do you design Twitter? Um, what, what services do, can you think about? And um, what will be the QPIs that you, you think uh, that may be? I don't know if anyone volunteering to, to answer like what service does um, Twitter provide? Okay, maybe I'll Twitter, just... right? so, sorry. Twitter provide a Twitter service, right? Yeah. Twitter your message. Can you split it? Like uh, I'll give an example. For example, you have login, right? You have person uh, profiling, a login okay. system, registration oh, you, you system. Mean that. I see. All right. It has <laughs> yeah, it has yeah, it has. All right. You can log in, you can post message, yeah, you can view messages. Yeah, you can uh, like can yeah uh, you can come can you come you can you can forward or whatever right? so yeah yeah it's yeah I can follow and follow a person that's all great yeah and also um, I have a list here you just look at this part you can register login and you can also edit your personal profile um, also post or share a, a tweet 
Um, you can also upload image and videos. Uh, also, um, news feed is really important. Uh, I think it's called tweet timeline. Also, follow and follow user. But I mean, there's more services, but you you can work with the interviewer um, to prioritize certain services because within like one hour or two, you won't be able to design all this. And uh, some data about the um, uh, the DAU, like daily active user. Um, I, oh, yeah, I have a question actually. Compared to monthly active user, what do you think is the proportion of the daily active user? Anyone have a guess? Uh, maybe one million. Oh, you mean monthly uh, active user? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, close. I think uh, it's uh, generally people say that uh, the number of daily active user is half of your monthly active user. So either people use it a lot every day, or um, um, yeah, or people who who actually uh, registered but never use it. So that's why we don't look at the um, the registered user number. We only look at the uh, active user. Um, also, there's about maybe um, six thousand new tweets every day. Uh, uh, I think it's every second. Sorry, um, and there's about six hundred thousand queries to get the timeline. So people. Um, like upgrading, uh, like uh, looking at their their timelines um, a lot, probably, and uh, reading pure PS. So here uh, it's really important that you separate read and write. So reading is uh, much higher than writing, which makes sense. I think a lot of people get information from Twitter, but they don't always write new tweets. Um, so you have to. To, to have a basic idea about uh, how much QPIs can one server handle. Maybe it's, um, it's a, a good server that you can buy from a cloud service is probably about uh, 1000 QPIs. So this server is a database or what, what does the server refer to here? A server is um, a machine, um, uh, a physical machine. So, I mean, read, uh, read or write operation usually refers to like a database, right? I mean, if it's a, like a, uh, like a, um, like a, uh, optimized data database, like you, know, you think of some cache, or mm -hmm. it could be faster, right? So just wondering, but this server means like a SQL database, is that? Oh, you yeah, yeah. I guess um, uh, this is the HTTP uh, request. Okay, okay, HTTP request. Okay, so uh, is there any other like you know parameters like memory? Disk of one server you can share. Um, I, it's uh, actually it's, uh, I think this this question you ask different people they have different ideas. I, I just uh, took an example from a book and I think I it's a um, very average um, result. It also, I, I think it was read or write basically only means goes to a data store. It doesn't matter what kind of data store. It can be cache. Well, can you can can have like a hierarchy of data store, right? It has like cache, and uh, behind the cache, it can be like database or uh, Redis or whatever, right? So, but if you get a post, that's a HTTP request. That's a, the different world basically means goes against different targets. So. Okay. Thanks. Um. So. Also, you might need to consider uh, celebrities have much more followers. When you're going to design your tables, you want to um, maybe also that can 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 work with with people with a lot of followers. I think there was an article talking about three percent of traffic in Twitter about Justin Bieber. Um, she's very interesting. Um, and also uh, you need to have a high availability and uh, have just the eventual consistency. So this means that uh, like uh, in our CAP serum, there's, uh, um, so we talked about, uh, I, I think I forgot to talk about what his uh, eventual consistency here. Um, so eventual consistency means that uh, at the end, all your 
um, service database, different uh, database will have eventually the same data for different uh, repli replica. But uh, it doesn't mean that every, at every, every single timestamp, they will have the same result. So basically, it might be that your friend tweeted five minutes ago, but you still haven't haven't received it yet. So this is called a low con not low consistency, but it's more like eventual consistency com compared to um, a strong consistency. Um, also, you you might need to consider about the caching in Twitter. Um, do you use memory cache or Redis? Um, what has the difference between them? Maybe a memory cache won't allow you to very to have very complex the value uh, compared to Redis. So the details, if the interviewer asks you, you should be able to answer this. Um, so in terms of the um, the data, maybe uh, uh, we we have those services and we have different. Um, also different services like different uh, infrastructure that you want to put to provide these services. I'll just uh, try to go through them. They're really basic so that uh, you can have a better idea about when to use what. Um, a lot of people say that if you're going to design a user table, you want to use a SQL because this allows you to have more complex queries, but it's more like a personal preference. And you want to use a, a NoSQL database for post or share a tweet uh, because um, uh, your tweet will never be, mostly won't be changed or even you you delete it, it won't be just disappear from your disk. It may be marked as deleted, but it's still there. Um, and the, the number of tweets are really large that you don't want to uh, mess with a SQL database because it's going to take a uh, very long time to, to get all the tweets. Um, and also, uh, in terms of the file system, um, I, uh, do, you, do you guys all know what is a file system? It's like uh, S3 um, or uh, Google, uh, how do you call that? Google. Um, well, file system is a, it's a code so that related to our operating system. Really it's a, ハイオスパーティングのデータストールアンドディスクイズライクユハウスフェイドアウトディスクライクユハウフォルダーネームユハウファイルアンドイッチフォルダーそうイズライクモーレクトリーアストラクチャーライクバッテリーイズノーレリ
it is limited in inquiry that you cannot do um, joint uh, joint tables or sub queries, but you can do insert, update, or delete. Um, unless the update is also different from a SQL database. In SQL database, your your update will be um, physically changing the, the the value in in the mem uh, in the disk. While for NoSQL database, your update actually just append a new line at the end of the um, the table, and um, it will do. I don't remember the name, not clean up, but maybe every, you, you can set up for, for example, every um, 24 hours, your table will look at all the updates with new record and then replace the old record with a new record. So the real update was done actually um, less frequently than the SQL database. Um, Talking about re re reliability, uh, we have to avoid single point failure um, because there's always the chaos happening uh, in the physical world. Um, so the most important part you should understand and also been asked is the horizontal sharding. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, what does it mean sharding? Is it the same like a partition? Um, actually, they are more or less the same. Maybe people would say that the sharding means sharding in different machines, but partition can is mainly like to have multiple uh, replications. Oh, to to have like all the it's like sharding in the same machine. Um, so the method you use for sharding is consistent hashing. Um, so this way, when you have new machine added, you don't need to. Uh, copy your data into the other machine. So for example, today your database is small, you have three machines and you you have an ID that you just divide this ID by three so that uh, you can have the mode of each ID, you have one, two, three, and then you put the, the number one into your first machine, two into a second machine and three into your third machine. One day you find that you don't have enough space in the three machines, you want to add one more machine and then your mode divide by three will no longer work. You have to recompute all your, all your hashing and then just copy a lot of machine, transfer a lot of machine into the new uh, machine, a lot of data into the new machine. So um, this way it's not consistent hashing. And uh, there's actually much more information about consistent, consistent hashing that is uh, very important that you should consider like reading some articles about it. Uh, I won't just go too much details here. And also, um, you also have to decide which key do you want to use to, to sharding. Uh, the general answer will, to this will be uh, whenever, like depending on how you're going to use your data, how you're going to query your data. So the key that you're going to use to query your data the most should be the key to sharding your, uh, your data. And also, uh, except for sharding, we also do replica. Um, replica is meaning that for the same data, you will have it in, in maybe in general three locations. Three locations, you don't want to put them into the same region. Um, in case if there's an um, uh, earthquake, for example, that uh, all your machine will be down and you want to separate into at least two, two regions. In general, that's what people do. They separate um, the same database into two different regions. And in one region, they just have one replica. And in the other region, they will have two replicas so that if there's a disk failure, they can very rapidly copy the data from the other machine that is located in the same region. And this, this copying will be much faster. And also there's a difference between backup and replica. Um, a backup is what you do uh, for maybe every every night when when people when there's less users or maybe um, at night, um, but uh, it only backup is it's just a physical copy. But replica is actually um, distributing the flow. It also contribute to the the querying, so it's actually working as a, um, a real machine. Uh, so there's a big difference between backup and replica. Um, so, 
And the second question will be, we're still in the, in the story of uh, designing Twitter. So if you're in, in, uh, your interviewer will ask you about how would you draw the schema, uh, looking at what you have designed based on all, all the servers you have, maybe you probably want to propose several tables. For example, you, ha you have a user table where there's a user ID, username, email, password and the friendship table. Mm, so you want to put, uh, you can always have one single line that uh, um, for, for each user, from which user to which user, and then create that. Or you can have them like in a one row, like uh, in, uh, in a single row that describe two relationships, like for the first column is the, the person who followed the other person and, and the second column is the foreign key of the other column. And um, yeah, it's just different uh, considerations that uh, there's a lot, uh, there's really a lot to discuss about. Um, and I highly recommend you to to, to take the, the class from Jiu Zhang. I, I'm, I'm not uh, like doing advertisement and not receiving any money, but they have two chapter that are free that you can take take a look and you, you will understand how much details are there in, in, in designing these tables. Um, also, you have Twitter table, which is really easy. Actually, it's just about the timestamp, the ID, uh, and maybe also the user ID and the content. Uh, you might want to put a, um, a URL that link the, the image uh, to, the, to the file system. Uh, the file system will be the real place to save your image or your video, but in your tweet table, you want to have the link to that file system. And also for each table, uh, it's not really written in these tables, but uh, in each table, you have to decide what you want to put as a primary key and a foreign key. Uh, basically, the primary key will be used only inside um, it can be incremental t, uh, in, uh, self incremental t, but uh, it's not really suggested because it will be um, it can go up to a very large number that exceeds your 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 um, how's it your your column size. And uh, well, we do recommend to use a UUID as a primary key, and also a foreign key will be the key that other uh, other tables are going to to query you, um, which is also generally generally what you use to sharding your table. Um, okay. Um, and then let's jump to the next service, which is to design the news feed. Um, this question can be asked for Twitter or Facebook. Um, so basically this question is like this um, this lead code question. I don't know if you have done this question. It's more the case sorted list. Um, so you have a bunch of lists and uh, uh, for example, you just want to, uh, okay, let's say that in this list you have multiple lists and they are uh, ranked based on timestamp or based on the number of the, of, uh, based on the size of the number. And you want to find the, the five smallest number, like uh, among all those lists. Um, so this is like when you have your timeline, you follow the 200 people. And if you uh, look at your timeline, you will get the, the newest tweets from all the people that you followed. So the general way we do it is to get the first element of each uh, small list, and then you, you you maintain a min heap, and then so that every time it pops out the smallest number, um, and once a small number was pop out, you will take the second number in this list to add it into the heap. Um, Okay, yeah. So that's basically how the news feed was uh, uh, was ca computed, and there's two models that you can use to compute it: either a pull model or a push model. A pull model means that only when the user open open their app and uh, uh, scroll down their Twitter, and this time at this moment you will generate this uh, uh, feed for them. And the push model was basically continu continually pushing the new tweets from the people you followed 
And even though you've never opened to it for, for one year, this table is still there. And uh, like in general, which table do you, which, which model do you prefer in this service? Um, yeah, actually, in order to have a better uh, user experience, it's better to have a, a push model here that uh, you will maintain this fees table. Basically, very simple. It's just uh, your user ID, and uh, in each row, you will just have the uh, the tweet ID, so that whenever you open your phone, you open tweets. Uh, there's already this this uh, timeline ready for you. And if you don't have this, you get you get it pulled every time when you open it. The user experience will be very bad. And so something actually very interesting to to always consider when you're designing your your system. Um, so now let's. Um, I mean, uh, the for tweets I, I ended here, but uh, there's much much more information about this topic. I didn't go deep enough into each single service. Um, but you can always find more information on the resources that I have put in this uh, presentation. Um, now let's talk about uh, design a machine learning um, system. Uh, maybe just before I start this, do you guys have any questions? Uh, can, I, can I go back? Can, can you go back two slides or three slides? Yeah, I just want to add some more. Uh, my input. So can I go back one more slide? Uh, okay, here, right? So basically, I just want to add my, uh, based on my yeah, uh, please. input. So it's, it's because uh, the sharding and the partition, right? The difference, what's the difference of sharding and the partition? It's kind of like, a, it's, a, uh, it's a little bit of different purpose. Sharding is more like a load balancing. It's trying to uh, say, you have a few data, right? So uh, let's say Facebook or Twitter, right? You have many users, but you cannot really serve all the user data from one data center or one uh, server, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You want to basically, uh, basically you, uh, you, for Asian, if you live in uh, Asia, right? So you want to, uh, most likely you're going to rate tweets, not, probably not, uh, that's only, you want to read the tweets only from Asia, Asian country, right? Mm -hmm. So all the data most likely will live, for the Asian population, the data lives in Asian data center. Mm -hmm. But for say America, it will live in North American data center. So it means it has a couple of benefits here, right? One is uh, uh, if American data center is down, it doesn't affect the Asian users, right? So that's basically for sharding actually. It's, uh, and the partition is more like a, a most likely, uh, it, uh, normally it's partition is for time-based, means if like a, I have five years data, right? I'm, I don't want, I don't want to really, uh, I, most time I will use most recent data, but the old data is more like a, for archive purpose. I'm not going to, I'm, going, I'm not going to like, uh, you know, uh, retrieve the old data so frequently like, a, the recent data. That's why we partition the old data, like put the old data in um, a different partition from the current, the most recent data. This way, uh, you don't really have go to the old machine, right? The the, the old partition. So this way, um, it's like um, you don't have to your database doesn't have to uh, worry about the old data at all because. Whenever you write a data, right? You, you, whenever you write data into database, you have to build the index for the data for the table, right? This way, if you partition the data, you don't really build the index for the old. You don't have to rebuild the index for the old data. If you delete or something like that, right? So you don't really, you don't have to cross partition, right? So that's one purpose, basically, uh, different purpose of shard and uh, uh, right and uh, the partition. The rapid car basically is for redundancy purpose. It's like, uh, let's say Facebook, right? It has so many users, but it has say, uh, you, you, if Asian country, right? Asian population, they have data lives in Asia, but somehow if their database, let's say, 
uh, yeah, that is something it's down or it's destroyed by some earthquake, right? So they don't want to lose all the data. So that's why they have uh, a replica in America, most likely, right? So this is just for re data redundancy. It means uh, if it's down, you're not going to lose any really data. It's for, uh, right? So normally it has three sub replica. The reason you have three replica is that it's uh, it has to do with uh, the way uh, the data uh, consistent to work because you need a one master, which means uh, you if you have three data center, you have you can vote for one master easily because one data center will have uh, one replica will have two votes, right? So this way it has its majority. So that's the reason you have three replica. So if one replica is down, the other replica, the other two can still work. The, the whole thing uh, for the audience, you, don't, you won't see any difference. But behind the scene, that means that's it. If another data, data center is down, then uh, this you still have a replica. But if it's also really down, then you lose pretty much everything. You, you, I mean, you, you, can, you don't, the user cannot have, cannot read uh, the data anymore. So. Is, but uh, behind the scene, it's a, they, they have a protocol basically trying to uh, make the data consistent across all data center. So okay. is a, the other number, right? Normally it's our number. So can you can you go to the next page? I just want to add my input. So it's, yeah, yeah, so it's very, very so the, the, I just want to say why the primary key, why, what's the difference? Well, generated by the database or you generated by the application. The, the difference is that when you, let's say, uh, depends on how you index the table. The data is really how you, when you add a new record to the, data, to the, to the table, right? So if, let's say, uh, if you want sequential, is the, if the sequence matters to you, you want the table to automatically generate the incremental ID for you because the, the sequence actually matters somehow, right? But if a sequence doesn't matter, you can generate a new ID. What's a new ID? The new ID is some kind of algorithm that you can generate, uh, it's guaranteed to be unique uh, 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 on the application side. It means whenever you run, you're, if you run application on different machines, different time, uh, even the same code, it will be guaranteed to, uh, to be uniquely to be unique across the universe. This means uh, not, not just for this application, for all applications for, uh, it's uh, pretty much it's uh, animated, like, you know, uh, so it's, uh, that's guaranteed. So. so is there scenarios where um, you absolutely need a self-incremental ID that the timestamp is not enough to show you the sequential information? Uh, no, uh, timestamp could because timestamp has a uh, has a uh, limitation, right? Timestamp, mm -hmm. let's say, you can only be uh, accurate to a certain uh, timestamp, like uh, up to millisecond, for example, right? Yeah. But for the field, let's say Facebook, many users may access right to the database in the same time. You cannot distinguish it. It cannot be unique. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 a. Uh, one reason you can you cannot use timestamp as unique ID because sure. timestamp can only be up to pre, like a it has precision limitation. Right? So okay, so that that would be for for the scenarios where the the sequential information is absolutely very important. Like yeah, if you for use, example, if you want it, yeah, you need it. So yeah. because your ID doesn't have sequence, your your ID just a random number. Much. Yeah, because in the uh, timestamp you can still have milliseconds, so it's. But the timestamp you have you you have the count, you have the problem there. Uh, if if two users have the same timestamp, then it's not unique, right? Yeah, you have UUID plus timestamp. I mean, okay, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But still, you lose the sequence, right? If, because yeah. you, the UID is not sortable. Basically, it, it's it's a sortable, but the sorting doesn't mix, doesn't give you, doesn't, yeah. doesn't yeah. have any meaning. Basically. Yeah. 
I, I, yeah, I see. Thank you, like for, um, are you are like a senior developer. How many years experience do you have? No, no, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, just like to, uh, you know, give my opinions. You, you, you yeah. take it with a grain of salt. Very, uh, very but, but, uh, insight. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, so. Uh, is there any other questions about the previous pages or things you want to add? Okay, otherwise I'll just um, I'll jump to the, the kind of second part about the system, um, the machine learning system design. Like here, yeah, I just want to make a small recall on the scenarios um, uh, where you, you want to design a machine learning system. Um, for example, everything here uh, we already talked about, and um, this is a very um, my personal opinion that beside of the the scope, storage, service, and scale, you actually have more things to do. Um, first thing is to consider the data availability and the collection. Um, this is different from the data you have in the general system design because you want to make sure that you have enough data to train your model. Um, and you want to collect it in a way that uh, can directly serve the model. And also you want to do feature engineering or some pre-processing or aggregation. Uh, for example, if you want to build um, a music recommendation, you want to uh, you want to not only um, mark which person listened to which music, you also want to mark how, how long does the person listen to this and does the person jump to the next song without finishing this song or for YouTube, is it is a video actually finished or is, does a person spend one hour on this video or just uh, two minutes on this video? So all those informations are very, very different um, from simply to say which user look at which video. And in terms of uh, uh, recommendation for e-commerce, um, you will also know that people not only buy things they, where there's a transaction was generated, they also click on, on items, they view items, they, sometimes they put them in their, in their chart, but they didn't pay. So all these informations are also very important. Um, and beside of the storage and service, which are, are, are very standard as in you, you have in general uh, design, uh, you also want to consider the model part. Um, it can be a simple model or deep learning models, but this model, you might need to uh, train it offline and then serve it online. How are you going to do this? And also the evaluation. Uh, the evaluation can, can contain two aspects. One is a statistical evaluation. Uh, what is a precision recall or accuracy? And also the engineering part, like uh, uh, will this model respond rapid enough? Like what is the average response time of this model? Um, uh, also, if you put uh, your model onto a production, for example, if it's a recommendation um, model that you put on e-commerce website, how many uh, turnover has this model generated? Um, this is a very huge number, aggregated number, but it's also very important to know. And also um, uh, one last thing that people sometimes forget is the privacy. Um, for machine learning. So basically, if I give you an example. I used to work for a company where we we gen, we, we do a virtual chat with doctor. Um, we allow patient to contact the nurse directly. And if the nurse thinks that the person needs to see a doctor, they will, so, so people can have, this patient can have 10 minutes video chat with the doctor. All the conversations between the patient and the nurse are, are private. But we have to use it, this data to train our model. One, one way to, to do it is, uh, is uh, to not look at the, the data at all and just train the model blind. But it's very hard like you can, if you cannot really assess the results. The other way to do it is to, to anonymize the data. For example, if there is address, um, phone number, and people's name, uh, 
we can have an algorithm that will be able to remove all those informations um, so that now only the model can use this data and maybe the, the data scientist can also look at this data. And also there's uh, the business people who also want to understand what's happening in the chat. Uh, can we make those chats more efficient so that we pay less nurse that can serve more people? So all those considerations about privacy, privacy are really important and that they cannot just be ignored. Um, here about if we have a real question about design recommender system and if um, an interviewer asks you this question, you, you, you might want to minimize the scope like we had with uh, Twitter. Um, so there's different kind of recommenders. Um, basically you will have um, an activity stream or feed like uh, for example, Twitter. Uh, imagine uh, that maybe uh, Instagram. Uh, so for Instagram, sometimes you, 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 can, you can get just a, a feed from people you followed, but you can also have another page where there's people you followed, but also the recommendations from other people that you might interest, but they are, but you didn't follow. Or the example of YouTube. I'm sure that you all know that when you open YouTube, it recommends videos that you've never seen before and you don't know who's a YouTuber. Um, so for, for the scenarios. So basically it's a more complex um, activity uh, feed compared to, to what we have just from the followers. And also uh, you want to narrow down, is this really this feed you want me to design or is something something else? For example, there's also item to item recommendation. That's what we call as a uh, cross selling. Um, for example, if I'm looking at this product, I just want to, there will be a list of other products that people show, but uh, I only see the other recommendations because I'm viewing this product and or, all this just for you or user to item and activity stream are like are probably more or less the same thing like what I just said. And the way we do it, we have two ways to do it. Sometimes we do it a content based filtering that is more or less the item to to items. Um, I'm watching this film and I got recommended other films that are related to this film, but not really uh, related to me. And also the collaborative filtering compared to the people who have a similar um, interest as I am. And people might recommend me things that the other person have watched, but I haven't watched yet. And in terms of the... Um, Okay, so now you have your, your, your scope maybe minimized into uh, to designing an activity uh, stream or feed. Um, now you want to talk about the, the schema with the interviewer. Uh, what are the, the raw schema? This is exactly the same as you, you design your tweet. There's no model in it. Um, for example, the first thing you might have interaction table. Um, maybe the first thing is to have a user table a user table with the user information and also user profiling table. I assume that, for example, you, you have an account on Netflix. Maybe you, you thought you, you tell Netflix your age, your gender. Um, that's two things you tell them, but in your user table, there might also have a, a interest of you, like how many time do you spend on action movies? Um, like there, there could be all those different profiling information that they generate, aggregate tape, aggregating table, and for maybe they generate every day or every month. Um, you have an item table. Item table is for each film or each product being sold on Amazon. Uh, you have uh, uh, this table because uh, if you contain. Uh, more detailed information of the item, which department does it belong, which category it is, and um, text description, uh, images, I mean, image URLs that links to, to, uh, to the file system, uh, all those informations about items. And also you will have a interaction table, like uh, how did you interact with which product, which video. Um, it can be web click or product you have bought, uh, all those kind of information. 
Um, and also based on this uh, tables, you also have the embedded embedded table. Um, for example, uh, Netflix will generate a, a vector for you. Basically, in this vector, there's just the um, numbers that each number describe one specific feature for you. But this specific feature is not action movie lover. It could be this, or it could be something more in the Latin space that uh, we cannot explain what it is, but uh, the other person who have this strong feature like you, you have similar interest. And for each item, it will be the same. This film is uh, for is an action film, and uh, it is probably very similar to another film that have a distance be between these two vectors that are really small. So some more details about this vector embedding technique. Um, I think people who does machine learning are really familiar with this vectors, but uh, for, for general dev people, uh, it is still very interesting to learn it because uh, um, basically it is everywhere. Like even, even though you, gen, you just design a normal infrastructure, but you, you know because it's the, the data is getting big and there's so many um, videos coming on YouTube. If you do not um, suggest the proper video to, the, to a proper person, the person will get lost on, on, on the app. Um, so basically the embedding allows you to, to do a dimension reduction. It allows to, to, to uh, how do you say, if imagine that you have a sentence, uh, this, this sentence compared to the vocabulary of the world, you have a lot of zero, 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 and then you have a one because you, uh, this word appeared in this sentence. So it's a very sparse vector uh, from a non-structured data, from words or images. Um, images, it could be very big because you have three colors, you have all those pixels in, in an image, and you want to embed it into a very dense vector. It could be, for example, 128 uh, dimension, and uh, it, can, it doesn't contain so much zero as it used to have. And, uh, so one very basic example, I think a lot of people have seen this, is the word to vec model. Uh, basically, if you compare the embedded vector, you you have women minus queen will equal to man minus kin. So this embedding shows you um, the relationships between different words. Um, also, for using the matrix factorization, where you have this a user item interaction table. This allows you to decompose it, the, the big sparse table into uh, a representations of users by different by vectors and the represent, representation of vectors for each item as well. Uh, this way you can, by uh, multiplying the item uh, vector, with the user vector, you get a number, and this number shows what's the interest of this person compared to this item. Mm, also, um, in terms of the models, here are some example models that uh, can do the embedding, but in general, even you don't do embedding, there's different types of models you want to know about what you want to put in the machine learning system. Uh, first of all, there's a rule-based, uh, for example, um, long time ago when there's a chatbot, if you say hi, and the chatbot will respond to you hi, and with your name on it. It can be done with a deep learning model, but it can also just be rule-based. It answer you automatically with this and to everyone. Um, other rule-based, maybe for fraud detection, um, for a certain, for uh, for example, for payment, just one one dollar payment, it could be from a fraud. Just testing if this credit card is available or not. And so, a lot of rules that people set in general. And also, this rule-based model allows you to have a a cold start. Um, uh, to for example, new user just started uh, registered in your website and you have you need a rule to start pr proposing uh, proposing uh, items to this user and that's what we call the cold start you can in general it's based on rule based or you can ask 
two or three questions, or you can have a list of um, music musicians that the person can select. So um, this, this two parts and then um, other models for recommendation, you can have collaborative filtering, which is just um, the, the metric factorization there, the same thing, and wide and deep. And also, um, which be, become really popular recently, is the graph neural networks that represent each item uh, and each user into a node in a graph that you can, you can train this graph and which gives you basically the, the connection between user and items. Um, yeah, so here's an example of Netflix about how do they design their recommendation system. That a big thing to, to, to notice that because of training a deep, uh, a model, a machine learning model sometimes can require a lot of resources uh, in terms of time and also in terms of GPU, but in generally um, in, in your service side, in your server, you don't have GPU, you just have CPU on the memory on disk. Um, so there's a lot of offline training. So if you look at this uh, graph, you have a part, they call it offline training and the near line training and the online training. So in the offline training, uh, they will have all the, the, uh, the data that they collected from the event distribution. They put it in Hadoop. Um, and there's, I think Netflix uh, Hermes is an internal service that they, they build. And they can, can continually train the model with new data coming in, but they don't always pull their model onto, into production. You can see this path from offline into online computation. Um, they have certain gates to allow a new release of the model. For example, they will set up um, a statistical uh, matrix, precision recall, and other types of matrix unless this new model can surpass the previous version, they will start to do uh, A-B testing, for example. And then after the A-B testing of a small group of people is working, is showing working fine, then they will eventually uh, deploy it into the production. So this is our, their offline training. In their uh, nearline training, uh, you can see that when an event uh, happened, um, so we got the user event queue, uh, which is a, the user activities got updated, but this information haven't yet been been going to the model training part and coming back to the to the online computation because this 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 path spent much more time. Uh, so this, but this user event is is very interesting because it allows one people um, one people just watch one film in the new category, but this person has never seen. Now we can start pushing new videos in this category to, to the user. Uh, this could be done by, for example, um, if we have the, here, uh, maybe this model content-based filtering, uh, there's um, a drama film that this person has seen and we have computed that this films are also very similar to this person, but only this green, this filming green, this person haven't seen yet. So we will give this film to, to the person so that this person can, can watch this film for, for the next. And the computation of, from this, the event happened to, to uh, the event that the person just watched this, uh, this film and the other two films that the person already view. And, and got re, uh, proposed this new one is very uh, short. The time to compute this is very fast. So this can be done online instead of doing it offline. Um, yep, basically that's it. And for in terms of e-commerce uh, large scale recommendations, uh, in my personal opinion, I think it's more complex than Netflix. Um, because items and products are being sold on Amazon or Alibaba much bigger compared to the few number of films on Netflix. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't have an account on Netflix. Um, so your model will be contain uh, three steps for basically when you have that much of items, you want to have a recall that is to remove um, the majority of the items so that you don't 
pass them into the ranking. Because we've talked about the ranking, the ranking is basically by um, computing a cosine distance um, between uh, two vectors. So if you have a lot of items to do the ranking, the computation complexity will be too much. So if you limit the number of uh, products that you're going to propose to the people, um, the computation will be very fast and it's, it will be possible to have the ranking stage online. And the recall, recall part can be online as well because it can be uh, some sort of a simple model. It can be rule-based, it can be uh, like multiple recalls. Um, so basically um, this allows you to have a very rapid uh, online computation and then eventually you have a fine tuning by removing duplicated items or the items a person already bought or the item the person recently viewed, um, et cetera. So there's so like something to consider as a difference between, for example, um, a, uh, a music or a movie rec a film recommendation or a recommendation for e-commerce. Um, so yeah, that's uh, everything I want to talk about today and uh, please feel free. And I really would like to hear different suggestions about what I shared. And also if you have any questions as well. Thank you so much. I, uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. Great talk. I just have a quick question with the embedding, right? So for the e-commerce, mm -hmm. um, so generally, how do you train the embedding? I, I know you can probably train the embedding using the uh, recommendation labels, but uh, is there any other way to train the embedding? Like if you don't have enough um, output yeah. or ground truth for recommendation label? Um, uh, so basically, uh, there's two two things. One uh, uh, one new, for example, new uh, product just get online is uh, we do the code start process. Uh, we can um, so basically we can push it to people who like the store. Like if you have bought things from this store, this brand, and there's a new product in this store, it can be pushed to you, or the or the seller can also um, pay money. It's, it will be like as bidding to to sell to promote their product in uh, on Amazon, and also another way uh, to do it is also to base on the uh, text description. You can uh, do um, you can do an embedding just based on the the sentence that describes the the product and also the image as well. Um, in terms of doing this in general, like for example, a VGG model in, in, in CNN or other types of CNN can help you to have this embedding and also uh, maybe a transformer or BERT algorithm can, even if it's pre-trained, it can still help you to, to have this embedding of text. And uh, an example from maybe from YouTube is that they, I think they train, they, they train this by, uh, by training a large um, classification model. Um, once you you know a classification model from a deep learning, you will have a soft max layer where you can remove your soft max layer. You take the, 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 the output from the last layer of your neural network and you keep this vector as your embedding that can also work. Yeah, so I, does it respond to your question? Uh, yes, yes, okay, thank you. Um, yep. Okay, uh, maybe you. another question. So, so when mm -hmm. you do near line, uh, which is in the middle of the last slide you have, uh, so you mentioned when users select some completely new category, uh, you're going to output a edit or modification to the user profile or user embedding, and that will be computed uh, in reasonably uh, real time and uh, because it may be is that is that just like a final additional model stacked on top of your recommendation system how, so how that fast pass fits together with the slower pass which is running on the neural network so how those two fit together mm -hmm. um so actually, I, I didn't really read this. Um, this there's a technical blog. I didn't read many details on it, but I, I'll just uh, assume based on my personal experience. Uh, once you have a model that is trained, say that here you have a model, 
um, you can continue the training and also you can do inference. Uh, for me, I think they, they use this model, the inference was done somehow like for the item to items, for example, here you can directly take the result to do it in, in near line uh, recommendation. And also it's more like to, to add your user experience to this, uh, um, to the inference that you already get from this model. And I, I guess this model also do online inference, there must be different models. Uh, so basically this part is more like um, it might take 10, 10 minutes to, to generate or two minutes, but uh, it's a, a model inference plus the user recent experience. Um, I don't know if this makes sense to you. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean it's uh, uh, if, if there's a recent update to the user profile and that has to be translated to update on the user embedding, right? And and that has to be recomputed for the whole network. So I yeah. I would, I, I would guess that's actually not the uh, um, not the online pass. I think that this this part will not be uh, included in the nearline part to to generate a new embedding of the user. What it does is only to for example to filter out um, for example, we were about to propose these films to this user, but this user already watched this film. And you can remove the, the film this person just watched. And also based on the recent uh, film this person just watched, you get a list of films that you want to propose. And you have another list that you already generated from either your offline computing or nearly computation. You, you want to... Um, you want to multiply them because they have the, the vectors and the, the different in, in interest in different levels. So if you do a multiplication, you can get a new list of the items that person that you want to propose to the person. I, I, I think there's much more details than this, but um, so far what I have understand. Yeah, okay, the, yeah, that's completely fine. I mean, uh, but it's just a, uh... If that's the way it works, then in the in the training stage, you will also have to have two stages or two pipelines, right? So how do you actually? Uh, uh, my guess is actually just my speculation is that um, the two models are actually trained separately. So one model is actually pretty fast, maybe like a simple logistic oh, regression. Yeah. I, I and see that will fit together. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, all right, thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably. Yeah. I, I understand they they have. Um, they have different models. They have either binary uh, binary classifications, just to say that if this person can interest in, can be interested in this uh, film or not, and they also have uh, um, more complex uh, models. Uh, yeah, they they do have different. Uh, but I uh, it's my fault. I haven't really read in details about this article, and I have put the link here. Thank you very interested. I think you can get more details from the, the article itself. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, oh, hi. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I have a question about, uh, yeah, still about the recommender system. The, so there's like a, a collaborative filtering and uh, content-based filtering. And uh, and I'm, I'm wondering like, uh, yeah, see, so we need to have like items to items uh, similarity or, and also we have a, a user uh to items so uh, yeah my question is basically about like uh, uh, what is the actually the performance trade-off between these two or for example in netflix uh, netflix and uh, youtube so i think youtube is more on more for the items to items uh it's more about content based right uh, i recommend new uh movies so for example, if we combine these two, then uh, if if we rec recommend some new move, uh, recommend movies to a user, we have to uh, somehow rank rank all those mm -hmm. recommended mm -hmm. movies by score, maybe from high to low, right? So my question is about how do how do the industry uh, like they they no they normalize the score between using these two different approach. <clears throat> Um, 
in generally for item to items, you don't need to train them uh, every second, like every time. You can be trained like once a day or it doesn't have to be um, very rapidly uh, be, be renewed every second and um, it's more offline. And in terms of user to items, you, you also have different algorithms. You can, so basically, whatever, which algorithm you use, um, your data actually will be outdated very fast because a person, right. imagine someone want to buy something on, on Taobao and this person just keep watching new products every second and you notice that Taobao can give you a new suggestions, maybe in 10 seconds. So this, this user to item uh, data actually there, they, they get to, to be renewed very often. Um, in terms of how how do you combine this two? It can be um, it can be uh, the person just watch a new new item and then you 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 just uh, multiply the two list for example with um, a different uh, uh, scores of uh, different item or different rankings so that you generate a new list so that the people have a feeling that, oh, you just uh, considered what this person just viewed. Oh, okay. Well, well back, um, back there, that your user to item didn't change, your item to item didn't change just because this new uh, item recommendation came in and you are able to change this one. And you're talking about YouTube, actually, we just did um, uh, a... Re uh, I think we have YouTube recommend. Did a sharing on this topic last week. Um, YouTube actually have two different models. One is the candidate generation. The other is ranking. Um, it it actually takes a lot of information. They they use a very old method to embed their video first. Um, based on the, I think, based on the text um, explanation of the video title. Um, also, the search token is what the, the user have searched uh, in, on YouTube. And also, uh, geographic embedding, I, I don't know what was that is, was, um, uh, Google, do you still remember what's the, the geographic embedding? Um, anyways, then you have the, the gender of the person, also the uh, the computed kind of age, what YouTube think, how old you are, and you okay. calculate everything and you push to radio and then you, you classify it and you there's soft max layer and you kind of take the user <clears throat> vector and the other one after soft max they consider as video vector. We wasn't so sure about this. And but it seems that it works this way. And then they use uh, the, the K nearest the neighbor to find uh, the nearest uh, videos uh, along with the user. And also they have a ranking algorithm. Um, yeah, I- Yeah, you can okay, that. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, we can maybe switch to the next topic. Um, I think there's another. You have you have another topic? No, not me. I think there's another um, expert who wants to talk about. Uh, no, you, we don't have a, another top speaker. I think we can. Maybe we can stop the YouTube so people can freely uh, talk over there whether you want to talk. That sounds good. Okay, yeah. Talk in whatever language you want to talk to. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you.